There's a lot that can be said about Appalachia and its people. Some good and some bad. For many years, it was a good place for my family to live and raise our children. But the times have changed, and so have the people. It's not the same place I knew growing up. Traveling down that cold town road, listen to my rubber tires whine. Goodbye to Buckeye and White Sycamore, I'm leaving you behind. I've been a coal miner all of my life, laying down track in the hole. Got a back like an ironwood bent by the wind, blood veins blue as the coal. Blood veins blue as the coal. There have been many times I've wondered what George's Fork looked like before my family first came here. There were no scars on the mountains, no highways or people. It was as it had been for thousands of years. My people settled the valley in the 1820s, hunting and raising gardens like many mountaineers. We know very little of those times, only that it was a hard and often unforgiving life, but worked the peace and freedom it gave them while the rest of the world was being industrialized. Like many Appalachians, they would find their freedom short-lived, few of them realizing the valuable resources their lands held, or the extent to which outside businessmen would lie, cheat, and steal to make a profit off of them. Geological surveys had really kind of begun to measure the coal that was under the surface in eastern Kentucky and, in, and uh, tremendous wealth of coal. And some people who learned of that realized that if they could acquire the rights to that coal and get enough of the rights in a certain area together, they could sort of bundle them up and sell them to somebody. At the same time coal rights were being swindled from our people, the timber industry was buying up their rights to make their own fortunes in the mountains. They would build massive sawmills and lay narrow gauge railroads to access every bit of timber in the region. W.M. Ritter brought his operations to Dixon County and his lumber company began clear-cutting the same forests our people depended on for much of their food and medicine. My great-grandfathers did their best to keep up with the changing times, one becoming a lumberjack and the other building his own mill to supply lumber to local people. The forest wouldn't last forever though, and when the mills closed, many families were left with little more than a shattered way of life. Appalachia uh, is a region that faces a number of challenges from an economic perspective and most of them are historic and it starts with the fact that the region is uh, not very accessible. The, uh, the mountains, the terrain uh, make it hard to travel through the region and that was a problem for early settlers trying to move through the region. It remains a problem today with trying to move goods and services throughout the region. With the timber industry gone, most people had little choice but to go to work in the coal mines. An economic way of life began replacing the small family farms that supplied our people with their food and their freedom. Times became harder than ever. Been a long time traveling here below. Been My great-grandfather went into the mines in the early 1930s, beginning a family tradition that would span eight decades. Coal mining was a lot different back then, though. During those times, it was called pick and shovel mining, when miners were paid by the ton and they had to pull the coal out with a mule. They even had to buy their own tools and dynamite from the company store, going in debt the first day they went underground. 
Coal mining deaths were numbered in the thousands during those days. Most of them could have been avoided if coal companies put mine safety ahead of their profits. But that wasn't the case, and miners had to unionize to fight for better treatment. My great-grandfather joined hundreds of other miners to unionize Clinchfield's mines. And when the company saw their profits being threatened, they brought in mercenaries and state police officers with machine guns to threaten the men. Men come from West Virginia, Kentucky, Buchanan County, and tried to organize this place. Of course, the coal companies are like they are now. They had the upper hand for all the law enforcement in Virginia is against labor. I understand that Virginia at that time had 150 state police. They had 110 of them down here in Clinch Coal. Number nine bridge, the union members was on the other side of the river. So one morning, Colonel Battle walked up on that bridge, draw the line with his foot. He said, the first damn man that crosses that line said, we'll blow him into hell. And he pointed back behind him on a hill, and they had four machine guns sitting up on that hill. And I honestly believe if a man had crossed that line, I believe he'd have killed him. So that's, that's the kind of trouble we had here about organizing. Dark clouds arise, sure sign of rain. The men wouldn't be drove around like bank mules after they organized. And I've worked in mine for the use mules. And they are badly abused. And the coal miner was too. But uh, after we were organized, then things started changing and changing for the better. With the unions in place, things got better for many people. But the coal industry has always been known to boom and bust, making it hard for many to live their new economic way of life. What we find with resource extraction economies is that while they generate a lot of economic activity during the time that the resource is being uh, exploited or utilized, uh, those jobs go away when the activity stops and typically we don't find that there have been long-term assets built uh, in a region as a result of a resource extraction economy. So with coal you could say that the success of the coal industry has uh, resulted in the impoverishment of the region. In the early 70s, when it came time for my father to make the choice of moving off or staying on George's Fork, he chose to stay home coming to terms with having to work in the mines to support his family. There were times the layoffs and strikes had my mother worried about making the bills, but we still raised a garden, we still knew how to can food, and we still had a community of people that stuck together when times got tough. For years, the union kept the balance between the greed of the coal companies and the well-being of the coal miners and their families. But the companies would never stop finding ways to weaken and bust the unions. In 1989, Piston Coal Company, one of the largest employers in the area, decided they would cut off the health benefits to their pensioners. In one stroke of the pen, hundreds of retired and disabled miners, and even some widows, received letters saying they no longer had health benefits. During those times, people wouldn't stand for it, and 1,400 miners put their paychecks on hold to strike against Pittston, to force them to reinstate health benefits to those who deserved them. I was nine years old when the strike came, and I learned what community meant during those days. I learned what greed was and what it meant to fight for people who couldn't fight for themselves. Even though my dad worked for a different company in Kentucky, he and his fellow miners walked out in support of the Pittston strike. We did all we could to lend a helping hand to those who needed it. After nine months, a contract was signed, and it guaranteed many things, but lacked even more. It wouldn't matter, though. In a few short years, the coal markets would fail and companies began consolidating and closing their mines, using the opportunity to shut down their union operations first. After 16 years working at a good union mine, my dad found himself without a job, along with thousands of other miners, searching for any way he could to support his family. Every now and then, he'd go to work in some of the smaller non-union mines that were still running, but safety was always an issue and the pay and benefits never compared. My dad loved his job when he worked in the union mines. He loved the sense of family and camaraderie they had underground. But he knew the way of the industry and the toll it would take on him in the long run.
just like it had on his father and his grandfather. Our parents never wanted us to face the same issues and always pushed us to do good in school to avoid a life working in the mines. When it came time for my brother and I to face the real world, my brother ended up enlisting in the military and I struck out on my own to find what I could to make a living. I stayed out of the mines as long as I could, even after the coal markets rebounded and the company started up their mines searching for coal miners. But like many others, I wanted the life our parents lived during the best of times, and I wanted it badly. After living paycheck to paycheck for 10 years and trying to raise two wonderful children, the high wages and thoughts of carrying on a family tradition were too tempting, and I decided to go to work in the mines. All the new mines were opened up non-union, and for a time I believed the companies were doing the right things. It wouldn't be long before I realized that nothing had changed and that the coal companies had us right where they wanted us. Many of us were going deep into debt for the things that we wanted. We were finding any excuse we could to justify our selfishness. It was as if we'd forgotten our past and forgotten where we really stood with the coal companies. I started working, you know, back in the early 70s. And the view of the coal company was that this is just a place where we work. We understood that they were using us, I think, in a way, and uh, the union, of course, was stronger then, and we understood that uh, they had their purpose and we had ours. And most of the time, their purpose wasn't always in our best interest. We understood that. Uh, nowadays, I don't think we do understand that. The coal companies and their associations knew how much we prided ourselves in being hard workers and that we made sacrifices to take care of our families. After they busted the unions, they began to use that pride against us. They began putting lots of money in campaigns like Friends of Coal and Coal Mining Our Future, playing upon our heritage to get us to band together to fight their battles. This is a plea for our people, for our families, and for our children. I would be remiss today if I didn't take the time to thank all you hardworking folks for coming out today and supporting coal. Our nation and our industry need more leaders like you with the courage and the conviction to stand up for the future of our people. Because a lot of folks would like to say that coal mining is done, that it's a dying industry. But if there was ever a resource worth preserving, it's the coal miner. For the companies, it was still about profit and safety was taking a back seat. Many of us lived in fear of performance-based layoffs or being outright fired if production goals weren't met. Without the union, I saw a bunch of people fighting to survive and sometimes fighting each other to secure their own paychecks. If a man's working and he's got a job, you know, he has, to, he wants to keep that job. And now, am, am I telling you he's gonna be unsafe to keep that job? No, I'm not gonna tell you that. But I'm just telling you this, a man's gonna do what he has to do to keep his job. You know, he's not gonna, He's not going to want to lose that job when he knows beyond a shadow of a doubt he's got 10 friends that are laid off not being able to do anything. So I would pray that, you know, that we would, we would not have to put a man in that situation. But we won't, a man needs to think about what he does. You know, your, your life's not worth going the other way. The companies now know how to manipulate us, using their well-paid human resource departments and public relations campaigns to convince us we all should be friends of coal. I used to say coal keeps the lights on, but I began seeing a much bigger picture, one that showed the truth of why we were still mining coal. They want us to believe that our sacrifices are for the good of a nation, but I had to ask myself, how much of the energy is being used, and what for? How much of it is being used for things we don't need? I began to think about the hundreds of cities and thousands of towns that have been built using cheap steel and powered by even cheaper energy. I thought of the thousands of profitable corporations that use low-cost energy to build their industries, giving rise to an economy where the rich are getting richer and the working people of this nation find it harder and harder to make ends meet. My questions have led me to find things so deeply wrong that I get sick at the thought of them. We are leaving our children a mess they can't deal with. A future of ill health, of cancers and asthma and unclean water. We are even teaching them it's okay to keep doing what we're doing. 
and it only gets worse. Coal companies are going into our schools and teaching our kids a different lesson about coal and even their history. Once a year in late fall, hundreds of children descend upon the small town of Emmalina in rural Knott County, Kentucky. These children are part of Boy Scout troops from all over the Commonwealth, hoping to learn about and enjoy nature. However, these children have a unique campsite. Thanks to Kentucky River Properties, the campers actually stay on a reclaimed coal mine. About three years ago, Dave approached me to see if it was possible to possibly do a Boy Scout event uh, on some property, a pre reclaimed property. And some of the Boy Scout leaders came down, we drove around and came up here and they said, God, this would be a great place to do campery and it's kind of grown from there. Back in 2010, the Kentucky Coal Association Campery, as it's called, began with the help from Friends of Coal. Initially, the annual event only expected around 100 campers, but 200 attended in its first year. Now the event hosts nearly 500 campers from over 55 Kentucky counties and two states. It certainly has grown the past three years. We've been uh, we've been absolutely thrilled with uh, with our partnership with Friends of Cool, and uh, just the uh, just the excitement level of our of our scouts and our leaders and uh, the units in general. We uh, hoped a couple years ago starting this this was just going to be like a day long tour of the property, bring some kids out and just kind of show them uh, the positives of coal mine, surface mining, and reclamation. It turned into all of this, and so uh, we've been very surprised, pleasantly surprised at the turnout. Um, one of the things that bothers me the most about the whole coal program, Friends of Coal, is that it's a way of taking us back to a time before the Union and before the battles that were fought. Because at that time, where we were so isolated, the only thing that they knew was what they read in the paper. And the narrative was written by the coal company. And today, where we've they've ingrained this Friends of Coal thing so strongly that it's taken us back. For example, in our school system, we have CEDAR programs, which is teaching how good coal is in a way. And then the kids, they have a choice, you know, to any of the things they want to participate in. They can, you know, participate in the uh, coal festivals or the folk coal you know, programs or science or social studies. And as a teacher, what I've seen is that the, the coal people give them checks. So they choose to do the CEDAR program because if you win, you get $100 or whatever. And science and social studies, they give a ribbon. So the kids choose to do something that gets them $100 instead. And I've looked over their goals. Their educational goals are good. They're written like to develop that sense of place, to develop that sense of family and all of those things and tradition. But the only thing is half the traditions left out. All of the union thing is left out. All the battles of what they had to do and the things that had happened is left out. With the coal company rewriting our past and leading people to believe we can't survive without them, we're losing who we are and what we're capable of. But some people haven't given up and they're trying to help us remember. So we look at a lot of these counties that were not completely but largely self-sufficient a couple generations ago. And now 95 to 98 percent of their food is being hauled in from not just out of the community but out of the state and more and more of the food that you see in the stores in the coal fields is produced out of the United States. That's, a, that's, that's been an unfortunate trend, but it also represents an incredible opportunity. And you find more and more of the folks who are selling food are, are very receptive to buying food from local producers. So as Grow Appalachia evolved, from being a program that, and this is still our primary mission, is to help as many Appalachian families grow as much of their own food as possible. 
We're now pretty intent on helping develop as many economic opportunities as a result of that local production as possible. We envision a future in the region where there are greater opportunities for people where uh, locally owned businesses are uh, at the heart of local economies where people have more say in the direction of the future of their communities and where the processes of governance are open and responsive to the people who live there. But the main thing is connecting. The main thing is say, hey, they don't have to control me. Enough of us can pitch it up and enough to create our own jobs if we have to. We're smart enough. We're better than what they think we are. I remember the ways and the bygone days when we was all in our prime. How us and John L. we get the old man held down in the blue diamond mines where the whistle would blow. Full two hours before daylight And a man done his best And he earned his good rest At seventeen dollars at night In the mines, in the mines, in the blue diamond mines I have worked my life And your dust, it's dark in my home. And now that we're old, you're turning your back. Where else can an old miner go? Well, it's big leather wood. How gone me belong? Now it's blue diamond, too. And the pits are all closed And it's get another job What else can an old miner do?